these phrases. So who knew that um, Gunkel meant gay uncle? I didn't. And I don't know if you did or not. So our main character is Patrick. And Patrick was a once famous sitcom star who, uh, because of an unexpected family tragedy, ends up with his niece and nephew for the summer. And at the beginning of the novel, Peter's life is very quiet. He's living in the desert of Palm Springs. He has a desert-like existence. Here you go, Gary, the desert. I'll go with that one. How does that sound? A desert-like existence, a desert-like life. He's isolated himself, self-isolated himself, and not much is happening in his life. And then this tragedy strikes. It was a tragedy that sent Patrick to the desert, the death of his life partner, the death of his love. And he escaped from the hectic life of Hollywood and just life in general to um, protect himself. And it was death that took him to the desert and it was death that brought him out of the desert. It was a real resurrection experience. Patrick's sister-in-law, Sarah, dies after a long illness. And I, I, I don't think I'm giving away too much here because um, it's probably on the jacket cover. I should read to see if it is. But uh, Patrick's sister-in-law dies after a three-year battle of cancer. Patrick's brother, uh, Greg uh, shares with Patrick at Sarah's funeral that he needs to go into rehab because he has developed an addiction to painkillers. So because of the death, because of the fact that Greg now needs to go into rehab, there are these two children that need to be cared for for the summer. And Patrick is being asked by his brother to take Maisie and Grant into his home and to care for them. And Patrick loves Maisie and Grant. They're wonderful. They're his, his, his wonderful niece and nephew, but he's never had to really care for them. You know, any time that he spent with them, it was a magical week when they would come to Palm Springs to swim in his pool. It was, you know, holidays with the family and the parents were always there to care for the children. Patrick was there to have fun with the children. Not too much, you know, as much like a puppy, you know, pet them on the head and then send them on their way. And what Greg is asking Patrick to do is to take the children into his home and to care for them. And let's not forget that he's taking the children into his home at a very vulnerable time at a, at a, at a, during the midst of tragedy. Their mother has just died and now their father is going to be going away for a couple of months. And it is up to Patrick to bring them into his home and to be their caregivers. And Patrick is completely overwhelmed by this. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, Patrick finds within him what it takes to take on this role as a primary guardian with a few bumps along the way, with a few gunkel rules in his pocket he moves forward and cares for these children. Uh, Patrick has no idea what to expect. I don't think these children had any idea what to expect. Life with Uncle Patrick, life with Gump, gay Uncle Pat, is very different than life with mom in Connecticut and dad in Connecticut. But nevertheless, they, they, they come together and they move forward together. Um, they... As I said, this is a very difficult time for all of them as the children are dealing with the loss of their mother and Patrick is still dealing with the loss of his, his great love as well as the loss of an acting career. And for those of you who have read the book, you know that Patrick's acting career is sort of stalled and he's just roaming around this, his, um, roaming around his home and poolside in his, oh, what are those called? Are they caftans or what? Oh, I, I can't, is that what it is? You know, so he's, um, he sort of shut himself off and he's dealing with his own grief. And then these children come in 
dealing with their grief as well. But for any of you who have ever spent any time with children, and I have Madison and William, my grandchildren, to attest to this, they don't let you wallow around in, in anything. They get you up and they get you active and they have a million questions and they sort of bring a new life and a new energy into any situation. So Patrick has been asked by his brother to care for these children over the summer. And over the summer, Patrick's eyes are open to a new sense of responsibility and the realization that even being larger than life means that you're still fragile and you're still human. And they deal with those issues of being very human and at times very fragile. And Patrick introduces these children to this larger than life, this oversized life that he has. Like I said, a life that they were not familiar with and his unique wisdom found within those gunkle rules and in other places. And in the process of this time together, they begin healing, all three of them. And again, I don't wanna give away too much, but this amazing book is a moving tribute to the power of love. It's a moving tribute to the power of patience and a tribute to family in all its many forms. Family in all its many forms. And it's even a tribute to what it means to be family in those difficult times in life and the support that we can give to one another. It is a love story. It is a love story between Patrick and the children. It is a love story between Patrick and his siblings. And those of you who have read the book know what I'm referring to, a powerful love story, also healing and those relationships with his siblings as well. Um, it has a profound message of hope and a profound message of healing. Uh, as much as I enjoyed the well-written humor, it reads like a really well-written sitcom. Don't you think? It's, it, it really leaps off the pages and you feel as if you're watching a, a very well-written, smart, comedy and it um it engages you this this smart comedy and as much as i enjoyed the humor as much as i enjoyed the wit and the dialogue it was the message of hope and the message of healing that i think i connected with most it was those intimate moments in the book those tender moments from the book when he was helping them in and in return really helping himself uh deal with uh, Patrick is grieving the death of his life partner due to a drunk driver. They're dealing with the death of their mother due to cancer. And I try, you know, in life, I try not to project, but it was a book. So I thought I'll just project away. And I could really go into this book and um, look at um, my own grief, the death of my mother, the death of my father when I was a teenager, uh, both died of cancer. and for me, there were actually moments of healing within myself. And this book never really goes dark, does it? it, it it's, it's light, but it's also powerful in that it's willing to go into those places. It's willing to go into those real life places. And I think that that is what sets this book apart. The author says that he based Patrick on Auntie Mame. And you're all probably familiar with the character of Mame, whether you've read the book or not. We all love Auntie Mame. We all wanted an Auntie Mame, or I did anyway. And, and Patrick, the author, based Patrick on Auntie Mame. And um, this Auntie Mame, however, the author uh, went, I think, even deeper into um, dealing with some of the real life issues that maybe with Mame were sort of just skirted around. You know, they, they dealt with them. I mean, certainly the little boy was with Mame because his parents had died. Um, Mame loses her great love. He passes away in the story. So all of that is happening. But you remember how Mame, the little boy, was shipped off to boarding school. Not that there's anything wrong with boarding school. For anybody who is from boarding school, I'm not here to offend. But in this book, the children are right there and Auntie Mame and the children are working together through their grief. And that is captured so beautifully in this book. And the author 
uh, has said that he uh, based the character on Auntie May and he was planning to go a little lighter, a little more surface, but then he changed his mind and he decided that he needed to go deeper because the author is inspired by those caregivers like Mame like Mary Poppins, like Maria from The Sound of Music. And knowing that you can see, you can see that influence in this book. And Mary Poppins had all of her magic in her little, in her little carpet bag. And she had her talking umbrella. But Patrick had his magic in his life experiences, in those things that he had experienced that he was able to share with the children. And he was able to connect with the children in a, in a deep and meaningful way. So there is a little Mary Poppins, there is a little Auntie Mame in this book, in this book. And I want to, I think we have time, I'm, I don't know what time it is, uh, but I want to read an excerpt from the book if I could, just a little excerpt and then we'll get back to our conversation. But I think uh, it's early in the book, so it won't give anything away, but yet it's really, um, I think, interesting. It's brunch. You don't know brunch? Is it breakfast? Grant asked while being strapped in his car seat. He was six and had a pro pronounced lisp. No, Patrick gave the straps a good tug, secure. 36 hours had passed and the subject of his taking the children had come up nine more times. He volunteered to treat them both to brunch without other adults just to avoid a tent. Fingers on noses, he said before slamming the door. Did I really just utter that out loud? It was something his mother used to say. Is it lunch? Maisie waited for an answer as Patrick crossed around to the passenger side. No, he checked the straps on Maisie's booster. Tight, too tight. How do you kids breathe in these things? She was nine now and no longer needed the chair, but she was on the smaller side and Greg warned him that she preferred it. We just do. Patrick stared at the kids. Grant had Sarah's features, including impossibly her third nose. Maisie had her hair and kept it pulled back off her face with some sort of elastic. He closed his niece's door before climbing into the front passenger seat. Then what is it? Grant threw up his arms, exasperated. exasperated. It's both, breakfast, lunch, brunch, get it? Didn't your parents teach you about brunch? Patrick bit his lip. Their mother wasn't even in the ground, and now Greg was about to vanish too. Now was not the time to be critical. But how do you not teach your children about the most important of all meals? He would trade an arm to be able to give Sarah a stern talking to right about now. Brunch was the pillar. Brunch was an early pillar of their friendship. Sunday brunch. It was a last ditch effort to see if it would ring any bells. It's Thursday, Grant screamed. Chill out, little man. No one can be that uptight about brunch. You're on the wrong side to drive, Maisie pointed out. Patrick took a deep breath. He didn't drive, not since the accident. For years, the studio sent a driver or he had spent his own money to hire a car. He was paid a ridiculous sum and it was easy to convince himself it was a necessary expense. Then with the rise of Uber, he never had to think about it again. Not in England. We're not in England, Gup. New England, Patrick said, as if that explained anything. He shot Greg a text asking if he would drive them. And why do you keep calling me Gup? I forget, ask dad. Great, Patrick stared at his phone. 
willing it to buzz with a return text. Already, two minutes alone with these children was two minutes too many. I just don't drive, okay? You don't know how? It was clear Grant had never heard of any adult not knowing how to drive, and he wasn't about to let it go. I know how. I don't like to turn, I don't like to turn my head because it makes lines in my neck. So I I can't use reverse. You don't have to, Gup, Maisie said. The car has a camera. She pointed at the screen on the dash. Gup. There's that name again, Gup, Gup, Gup. They'd been calling him that all morning. I know it has a camera, Macy, but cameras lie. No, they don't. Cameras don't speak. They find a way. How? I don't know. Wait until you turn 40 and then all they do is lie. Patrick thought of the recent headshots he had been strong-armed in, into sitting for by his agent's new something uh, assistant and how they had acquired an arduous effort for the retoucher. Greg opened the door and hopped onto the seat. Someone call for a ride? We need you to drop us off at the restaurant. Greg started the engine as he fastened his seatbelt, all in one fluid motion. Why do your kids keep calling me Gup? Gay Uncle Pat. Greg's ex expression said it all. Duh. Patrick was appalled. Seriously? What? Greg began as he gripped the wheel. You don't like being gay? I don't like being Pat. Are you our gunkle? Maisie asked. Patrick buried his head, his head in his hands. Make it stop. Audra Brackett in my class has two gunkles, she continued. She's my best friend. Gunkle Pat, Grant exclaimed. Patrick, Gunkle Patrick, we're not doing Pat. Pat was so, oh God, he didn't even know the word heterosexual. And I don't like Gunkle either. What's wrong with Gunkle? Greg asked. What's right about it? It sounds like Kankle. Patrick flipped down his visor to catch Maisie's eyes in the mirror. Calf and ankle, he said, before she could challenge, before she had a chance to inquire. Greg threw the car in reverse, looked over his shoulder, and backed out the driveway. You don't have to do that, Dad. There's a camera. For the first time, Patrick recognized a little bit of himself, the know-it-all in his niece. Yes, he does. I'm going to teach you some things while I'm here. That's Gunkel rule number one, okay? If we must. Cameras are our enemy as much as they are our friend. Scratch that. That's Gunkel rule number two. Gunkel rule number one, brunch is splendid. A little excerpt from the Gunkel. And Patrick was full of these Gunkel rules to live by. And um, as our modern day Auntie May, he was full of wit, wisdom and rules to live by. And a few of his rules are as follows. Gunkel rule, brunch is awesome. Patrick only eats two meals, brunch and lupper, lunch and supper. He occasionally has a snappetizer, which we all know is a snack and an appetizer put together. Uh, Gunkel rule, fun drinks make everything more interesting. That could be true. Bottomless mimosas are not some not the same thing as pantless mimosas. Everybody at Quincy Exchange or any place in the Corning area who serves brunch is glad that we've clarified that just a little bit before Sunday rolls around. Uh, Gunkel rule, clothes have no gender. 
everyone should wear what makes them comfortable and expresses their true self. And you can see from these gunkle rules, and there are many more gunkle rules, that some are lighthearted and funny, but others really do pack a lot of truth in them and communicate a message in sort of a lighthearted way that's that's very accessible. And Gunkel rule number, this Gunkel rule where it says we should wear what makes us comfortable and express our true selves was my inspiration for my wardrobe today. You might have said, why is Troy wearing a hoodie? Well, I'll tell you, it ties into our Gunkel story because on my hoodie is Angela Lansbury, Murder, She Wrote. And as you know, there's a couple ways to take this. Murder, She Wrote, Jessica, the great novelist and crime fighter. There she is on my shirt, ties in perfectly to book sandwiched in. Miss Angela Lansbury played Auntie Mame on Broadway and actually won a Tony as Mame and was later um, passed over uh, when they made the movie, not the movie, the television movie with Lucille Ball because Lucille was more of a, a draw than they thought Angela would be. Although her... Um, partner in crime, B. Arthur, was tapped and was play, did play Vera Charles in the um, adaptation of Mame. But again, Angela got the last laugh as she became Jessica Fletcher on Murder, She Wrote. So my point here is wear what makes you comfortable, Gunkel rule. Um, Maisie and Grant throughout this book, I love the fact that I think it really added to the, the comedic element of the book is they, they would hear Patrick Snarks and his zingers and his pop culture laden wit, and they would take it literally. It was sort of like Rose on the Golden Girls. You know, and it really added to the sense of fun because they didn't know what he was talking about. For those of us who did, it was absolutely hilarious, but they didn't quite always get it and know what he was talking about. But, you know, that was the wit and wisdom of our modern day gay Auntie Maine, our, our, our Mary Poppins. And like I said before, this is going to be coming out in a film and I can't wait to see how how um, they put it together. But more than that, I can't wait to see how it is received, how it is received, because this is going to be a, a, a mainstream family comedy and it's gonna be publicized as a family comedy. It's just a different family than many are used to. But this is gonna be a family comedy, not, it's not going right to television. It's not gonna be, the new Netflix movie, Lion Gate is actually putting it in the theaters. It's gonna be on the big screen. And so I'm interested in seeing how they adapt it, but I'm also interested in seeing how it is accepted because as much as things have changed, there's still much work to be done. And I think I have a, a, a couple more minutes. Is that, am I doing okay, Louise? Okay. So, um, uh, interesting story as we're talking about this, I was I was reflecting on this and an article came up, I think it was the New York Post, an actor, um, Mario Cantone, uh, Sex in the City, other movies, um, comedian. He was talking about the fact that in 1986, he was invited to be on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. This was in 1986 and they were all so excited about Mario being on the show. And then one of the producers watched an entire uh, clip, an entire piece of Mario's standup. And he said, well, we're gonna have to uninvite you. There's a gay edge to your comedy and that would make Johnny uncomfortable. So I want us to just think about how much has changed over the years but also how much work still needs to be done. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna share with you a personal example. Uh, Kevin and I are host parents. So we have a foreign exchange student in our home. And this foreign exchange student was with another family and due to circumstances, they, they, uh, a host family was needed. And so a friend of ours came to us and said, would you be interested or willing to open your home? 
So for most of you, you know, the, the, um, the question would be, am I willing to open my home? So Kevin and I were under renovation right now. We only had one bedroom that was a spare bedroom, but we're like, absolutely. This child should be able to stay in the school district. We hate to have him, you know, he's made friends. He's in the play, yada, 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 you know, soft heart, you know? And so yes, we'll open up our home. But the question is, this child is from Turkey and things are a little different in Turkey. This child is also Muslim. Is the fact that Kevin and I are a same sex couple going to be an issue? Well, we asked the question, the child asked the parents, everything was fine. Uh, AYA asked the parents, everything was fine. And then the State Department also had to make sure that everything was fine. So in order to live in little old Addison, New York at my home, the State Department had to get involved. Now I understand it, I'm not criticizing it, but what I am saying is as much as things have changed, there's still a lot of work to be done. And simply opening up your home um, to, um, to a foreign exchange student, uh, for you, if you're a heterosexual individual, you probably wouldn't have to have the State Department involved. So it's just interesting. And I also was kind of impressed that, you know, that it went to such lengths, you know, I'm like, wow, I must be really important to have such people involved in these things. They must have gotten a glimpse of my Facebook page and my Holly Dolly advent calendar time or something. And now I'm world famous and they wanna get involved. I don't know. But before I, before I um, turn things over to our conversation, uh, Louise had asked if we have any book recommendations and I sort of say this tongue in cheek, but maybe not. So James Patterson and Dolly Parton have collaborated and they have a book coming out on March the 6th, Run, Rose, Run. And Louise, I think that that would be a great book to have a book sandwiched in in the future, or certainly a great book to have at the Corning Library. So uh, always promoting Dolly, always promoting Franz Landing 996 Addison Road Painted Post New York for all of your dining uh, needs, and certainly a big promoter of the Gunkel. I want you all to read it. I highly recommend it. It's a great book. And um, I'm now wondering if we have any questions or comments. So there is one comment um, from Peggy that said the book is also a tribute to the healing power of humor. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that humor is what makes this book accessible. And I think that humor uh, helps uh, helps to uh, tackle the the deep issues that are in this book. And I have found humor in my own life to be a coping mechanism. And I think if you and I I, I don't want to generalize or stereotype, but I also think if uh, in the gay community, um, mm -hmm. when you're growing up to survive, you go to humor. Uh, many times, people I I'll talk about me. I went to humor to survive make them laugh before they punch you. So um, I think you find that in this particular book that they use humor. I think you find uh, that humor can be, um, yeah, I 100% I agree with that. And I think that, you know, sometimes we laugh instead of cry. Um, so Annie and Gary say with all that's um, happening in the country today, they worry that the Gungle movie might be banned. Um, yeah, a, a lot of books. I mean, To Kill a Mockingbird? Are you kidding me? I mean, come on. Um, so Lisa says, asked the question, um, and I think you probably would have said if you knew, but um, do we know who's been cast as Patrick in the upcoming movie? Or I, should we speculate on who should be that? <laughs> well, I don't know who has been cast. Um, there are the characters, you know, I'll, I'll get to that, but you know, the character next door, the neighbor who's in the thruple, I think Leslie Jordan would be a wonderful character to play the next door neighbor. You know, Leslie Jordan, who just did his book, How Y'all Doing? And he has got a country and Western album and he, really became rediscovered by folks through his Instagram 
uh, account as everybody was hunkered down, but he's absolutely so funny. So I, I say Leslie Jordan for that. For Patrick, I don't know. I would sort of like to be discovered, but um, since I don't have, you know, the proper credentials to be a movie star, uh, I like Mary Alice's uh, mm -hmm. comment Nathan Lane, because I think Nathan Lane would be wonderful. The movie Birdcage, I still am I laughing out loud and, and just watched it the other night. And it's still just as funny all these years later. I, it's timeless. And that's about that's that's about a family. And that's about a um, that's a family movie, in my opinion, as well. So I am particularly enamored if anyone's watched Station Eleven of the girl who plays Kirsten as a child, and she would be great as the daughter in this movie. Anybody else have some thoughts about that? Casting choices? You know, because if in my crazy mind, Ron Howard developed the movie um, uh, Hillbilly Elegy based on Book Sandwiched In, somebody might be watching this um, when it's on YouTube and they might just say there's a great idea for casting. You just never know. But it, I think it's I can't wait to watch the movie. And um, the fact that he is actually Stephen Raleigh, the fact that he has written three books and all three books are in production, I think is absolutely phenomenal. And I think that speaks volumes. And his his um, spouse is also a writer. Um, I'm not from Byron Lane. I'm not familiar with his work, but um, that's pretty impressive. And they actually live in Palm Springs. So I could see, you know, it's interesting that uh, the writer, you know, drew on a lot, you know, Palm Springs, uh, his love of Auntie Mame, his own life as a gunkel. He's a gunkel with five um, nieces and nephews who have come and stayed at his house for, for summers and things like that. So um, I think it's so interesting. Oh, anybody else? Hey, Jenny, we haven't heard from you today. There's no pressure, Jenny. It's okay. <laughs> I uh, I really enjoyed the book it, on so many levels. Um, I particularly, because I had been involved before I came to Corning in the theater, you know, theater people, and, and that was my first introduction to the gay community was on stage. And I just loved the idea of him being so aware of, um, you know, growing older as an actor and, and what and, and how he described that uh, being so difficult in his life. That was fascinating and fun. Abs uh, you're exactly right, Jenny. And I loved that aspect as well. And it was almost like, see, I love uh, biographies and I love those sort of behind the scenes sort of things. And it really had that element to it as well, as it took you into the world of, of Hollywood a little bit. And you could see this, this character dealing with his age, dealing with romance, dealing with uh, fame and, and how it had waned. And then, you know, the resurgence of interest based on social media, based on YouTube. And if that isn't 2021, 2022, I don't know what is. Um, so one thing you didn't mention, Troy, that I think was interesting is that he really had no intention of taking these children, but because his sister thought he wouldn't be able to do it, he, just, he decided to race to the challenge and jump in there and prove her wrong. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, excellent point. And, and how many of us have relationships, maybe not to that extreme, but have those types of relationships with our siblings and even into adulthood. It's nothing like a good challenge to get you to uh, do something you don't want to do. And for uh, those of you who have read the book, you also see how the sister responds later on in the book to his accepting that challenge and how maybe, maybe she feels a little differently about things mm -hmm. as the book goes on. And I thought that interesting too. And I'll tell you, during that piece, you know, he stood up for himself. Um, but I also thought about the powerlessness in all of that and how 
uh, somebody could come in and say, okay, these children are leaving. They're no longer under your care and your family as it is, is, is over. You know, um, I just, I, I felt some powerlessness as I'm reading some of those chapters. As funny as it all is. Yeah, anyone else, any other comments or questions? It's, it's funny too, I, I want, because I saw Gary's uh, comment or Annie's about COVID too. Um, there is a connection here too, as we were all hunkered down and, and spending more and more time at home, Patrick had isolated himself and he was isolating himself in the desert, in his home. Uh, and it wasn't until these, well, and the children come and they're, they're sort of isolated too. They're avoiding the sunshine or, uh, or life in, in general, and they're spending a lot of time at home. And I think there's some connections to that and, and COVID as well and how we isolate. But you're exactly right, Gary, we're those jammers. You, you if you want, I actually have a, a, a pair of Dolly Parton pajamas that I'd be act willing to gift you. They're a little small, and I think that you'd be able to wear them. So um, wear your jammers, everybody, and never feel bad when you come to Book Sandwich Den in your jams. Great. I want to just mention, too, the cover. Mm -hmm. It's like sunshine and happy. And just looking at the cover, I've had this on my coffee table, and I actually went to the card carrying shop and bought a copy of the book to give to a friend. It's just like a touch of sunshine, and it just makes me so happy when I look at that and I see Patrick and the children and the little dog. I'm forgetting the dog's name, and I should. It's Mar Marlene, Marlene, Marlene. Anyway, it makes me happy. Doesn't that make you happy? Doesn't that look like sunshine on a snowy day? And that's what it is when you open the book. So never judge a, my, my point here now is, thank you, Pam Sonnefeld, for making me read this book. Never judge a book by its cover. And I, I uh, recommend it highly to everyone. And Peggy says she wants a poster with the Gunkel rules. That's a great merchandising idea. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and I'm trying to, and I'll tell you, we went, my sister's birthday was yesterday, but on Sunday we went to Quincy Exchange and had mimosas for, for brunch. And I, and I, I, I didn't say it out loud, but I sort of laughed to myself and thought, I'm glad everyone's wearing their pants. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks everyone again, especially to those of you who um, suffered through all of these this time with our technical problems. And I will say, I am batting 1000. I forgot to start the recording on time, but I did get <laughs> most of it. Um, I think my only other comment is, I'll show my age by saying that Mame will always to me be Rosalind Russell. Oh, absolutely. She's she's the best. And that and, uh, sorry, Angela. It's sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and we'll definitely uh, put your suggestion on our list. And I will say that um my love for Dolly so outweighs my disdain for James Patterson that <laughs> we'll definitely consider it. <laughs> well, thank you, Louise. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks, everyone. And uh, remember, send us your ideas, or we'd love to have you join our committee. Um, and uh, stay safe, everybody. Stay warm. Enjoy today's balmy 44 and sunny. And we'll see you next year in person. <laughs>